All right, so this is a meeting of the uh, Vital Communities uh, Child Care Facilities and Programs Model Working Group. Um, and I'll just kind of kick it off here. Well, actually, before I kick it off with a status update, does anybody have any questions, Brenda or Faye, about anything before I do that? I stop rambling. Doesn't appear to be. Okay, that's good. All right, <clears throat> so uh, the, the child, uh, child care property tax exemption, I had... Um, I met with New Futures on that and uh, Senator Rebecca Whitley um, and asked Senator Rebecca Whitley to sponsor that bill. And I didn't get any response from her. So I've gone outside of that. I talked to Senator Prentice who represents this district here with, with the city of Lebanon is in. She's agreed to do that. And then we'll speak to uh, Senator Whitley. Uh, both of them are Democrats. I also reached out to Senator Carson and Senator Jeff Bradley. Senator Jeff Bradley is the majority leader. He's a Republican in the Senate. And um, he just had a couple of questions and wants to talk more about it as we get into the fall. Um, he wanted to know if, uh, ensure that NHMA, uh, what, what NHMA's position on that is, and NHMA supports that. So that won't be a problem there. So I'll have further discussions with him. I already have three state reps who are willing to sponsor it as well. So we'll have bipartisan support in both the House and it looks like in the Senate as well. And we'll get all 10 sponsorships. So that shouldn't be an issue. Um, NHMA is just doing another final review of their attorneys uh, on it just to see if there's any changes they propose before we submit the LSR. So that's the latest update on that. Public-private partnership. We had a meeting with the child care providers uh, in the area, including Vermont and New Hampshire, um, to get their input on that. That occurred, was it last week? Week before that, week before that. Um, July 28th, I wanna say. It was actually pretty, uh, it was, I thought it was a really good meeting. Uh, the providers in Vermont wanted to have some additional meetings with some of their providers, so we agreed to do that. I don't have any dates for that yet. Uh, but those uh, should be hopefully coming up soon as to when those will be. Um, there was the, the concern, of course, with no, no big surprise, was the concern that this center may take staffing from other providers. Uh, we understood that going into it. Um, and what I had suggested, I'll wait till Jen gets on there. So as I indicated to them, I mean, they're losing people anyway. They're, they're losing people to become nannies, that are people that are going to public education, people that are going to Walmart or wherever else for, for jobs. That's happening already. And we have we continue to have child care centers that are closing down. Um, there was one that closed down in Enfield. One of my employees was hoping to bring their child there. That just closed down. And Amy Brooks is fostering, is trying to, trying to keep one alive here in Lebanon. That's uh, problem right now. It would create 40 holes um, if they close down. So anyway, um, so the next steps are, so but anyway, it, it, the, the discussion was pretty encouraging and there were some pretty good ideas that, uh, that came up by some other providers. Um, so I think the next steps we have, I have a meeting on Friday with the steering committee. We'll talk more about it to move forward or not. And then there's, again, I, There'll be meetings, a couple meetings probably with Vermont providers, and I don't have the dates on when those will be. Um, I'm not coordinating those. I'll just be notified when I need to appear for those. Uh, I'm going to be going on vacation on Saturday, and I'll be gone for two weeks. I'll be back until the 6th of September, so it'll be sometime after that when those happen. Um, so that's basically the, the latest uh, that we have. Uh, as you know, we talked about this before, there's, there's somewhat of a tight timeline on federal grant funding if we're going to use ARPA funds or try to secure ARPA funds. And if not, if we're looking at direct congressional appropriations, senatorial appropriations for next year, those have to be submitted in, I believe it's April, March or April of next year to be considered for that next round. Earliest something could happen would be in 2024. Um, if we don't apply through those two routes, then you look at community development block grants, state tax credits and things like that to help subsidize some of that. That becomes more challenging. One of the discussions that the providers had wanted to know if any of these funds could be used to help build, for instance, construct a bathroom and a home care provider so they could take increase the number of kids. It, it would be very difficult to manage that. I don't know how that would be done. 
I don't see that as likely. Uh, try to have a grant program of that nature. I'm certainly open to discussion about that. There was also uh, what was brought up about you know, the feasibility of multiple providers coming together to create some sort of co-op through a child care center. Um, and I said, that's certainly possible. It adds some challenges, some complexity to things. You'd have to have some sort of governing, a governing body and a governing agreement. Um, it certainly would be a lot easier if there was one provider that was operating a facility. But anyway, those are options that, and we've talked a little bit about that in the past here with this group. Um, so that's the latest. There really isn't anything new since then. The, the consumer cooperative gone no place right now. I'm still waiting for data, uh, which we got some of that data last Friday. It was, uh, no, the, the Friday before that, I think it was. Um, Joanne uh, Roberts is now working as a coordinator for Vital Communities, 10 to 15 hours per week for now until she completes her, um, she retires from her full-time job next July. And I believe they're in the they're in the finishing stages of hiring somebody full time to do some of the management around this. I don't know where that stands today. I'll find out more on Friday. Brenda, you had a question. I was just curious about the um, yeah, just backing up a little bit. I didn't want to cut you off there, and then I I wasn't sure <laughs> what can, the full right. report sounded like. But um, I, I'm curious, like in that public private conversation with programs from both sides of the river, um, how many programs were there, and were they like? So yeah, how many how many people showed up? I think it was like 18 altogether, but some of them were people on our boards that, you know, but a lot of the faces I wasn't from, I don't know who the folks are. Um, um, I'm just curious. So yeah, um, I'm, I'm just curious about representation. So were there, were there some family from the Vermont side? Do you know if there were some family childcare homes? Uh, Jen, I think you're in that meeting. Do you remember who the, you, you would know better than I do who those folks are? She may not be able to jump in. Oh. Sorry, I'm driving. Um, oh. I I didn't know all of the families, um, Brenda, but I do believe that there was at least one or two family home providers from Vermont that were present. Um, okay. Did you receive the recording from that? Because I know that that has been shared, but I'm not sure how widely shared it was. Oh, you know what? I don't know if it was. Um, so just a quick backstory. In May, my mother was entered end of life stages in June she passed away in the end of July my family took our annual vacation um at some point I also had a week of COVID in there unexpectedly so hence my not being here for several months I didn't just drop off the face of the earth I've been trying to keep up via email but um it's been a lot I spent about yeah I spent most of June in New York State being with my mom and my family um and so um that's my backstory I did not listen to a recording or watch it. I'm not sure if it was a video, if it was videoed or just audio recorded, but um, so I don't, I don't even know. <laughs> I'm still waiting through emails, believe it or not, but I, I don't know if, if in fact I have that in my inbox, but if someone has it and, you know, feel free to forward it again. I think my other question is, um, uh, so we know that then there were some centers and some family child care, um, and I, I, I really do wish that I could have been present for that, but um, because I know, I know so many programs in Vermont, um, and I guess my I asked for several reasons. One, I think, um, well, I guess my next question actually is: Is there a plan for targeted outreach um, for people who didn't have the capacity to show up, either because they just are <laughs> this close to burnout, or they didn't know about it, or um, they hadn't opened that email, or they were on vacation, or like, is there a plan for um, targeted follow-up outreach for people who weren't able to weigh in? Well, first question, Le Leona, do you know if that? Sorry, yeah, I was just looking through my inbox so I could find that link for you, Brenda. So awesome, we thanks. did send out a, um, I hope it went out um, to the most of the people who were initially invited to that, um, that meeting. Um, a copy of the recording and also a survey that they could fill out to read over the, the proposal and share their thoughts. Um, I believe I need to talk with Sarah again to see if we're going to try and ping people again, because I don't yeah. think we got a lot of responses. You won't because people are burned out with surveys. And I mean, I'm just saying that like matter of factly, not even it's just, yeah, people are so people are already oper operating from a place of um, <laughs> 
burnout really. <laughs> um, and so it's hard to sort of have capacity for anything in addition, even when it directly impacts them. And um, I think the other reason, and I'm looking forward very much to, to, um, to for that link, thank you. Um, I think the other thing is I've started to hear from programs who say, have you heard about this Lebanon project? Um, I'm already worried about staff. I'm concerned they're going to take it away. So I'm glad that somebody showed up and said, we're concerned about the staffing steal. Um, and I also, um, uh, another, um, I got an email just a couple of days ago from a program director on the Vermont side who said, hey, um, I, uh, you know, here there's this big program being developed, you know, the timeline. And I think the perception for some folks, um, maybe with less information, is that it's like sort of immediate and that they should be like, that they, you know, that they should need to be concerned about it right now. And um, I just want to make sure that, you know, that folks are aware that it's actually like several years out that, you know, uh, the solution that's being discussed um, and the, you know, sort of the proposal is um, dependent on funds that aren't yet in the bank. And so um, I don't know how that's being communicated, but um, I think enrollment is another one um, for especially if, you know, I don't know. There, I'm, I'm hearing concerns in the community and I'm glad some people showed up and oh, was that the link for me? Thank you. Um, I'm glad if some people are showing up and, and expressing their concerns. Um, Brenda, I would just add to you, like, you know, the, those concerns were, were expressed from the few people that were at the meeting. I do believe we, there was discussion about having further conversations, maybe even at um, smaller community uh, leader meetings. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know the term in Vermont, but like we have like directors meetings for like, you know, our county area. Um, okay. So there, there was discussion about bringing it to those meetings, which um, one of the family home providers had suggested. Oh, good. Um, so I don't think anything's been planned yet, but that, there was conversation about that to try to get more involvement. And as, as far as the survey, I just wanted to say from, from my own perspective, like I went on to do the survey and I believe I did one of them, but the questions itself are like, really thought provoking and I found it really hard to answer because there's still so much unknown as to what this program would look like and what it what its impact would be and I think it was the survey felt like we were really trying to get a concrete answer as to what the the impact would be or, or what would you be excited about and I had a hard time answering those questions even though I've been a part of the conversation so okay. I, I feel like that survey has been really difficult Difficult. So even if we are burnt out with surveys, those of us who tried to answer, I still found that I couldn't. I couldn't respond because I didn't. I didn't know how to wrap my head around the whole project itself. Okay, that's actually probably good feedback for whoever created the survey. Um, um, thank you, Jen, for that. My next question was, and I think it's my final question. I'm sorry to be pummeling with questions. It's um, but to just clearly understand um, is who do we know who is hosting? the like so Vermont requested some more meetings and do we know who would be hosting those because there are people who would be logical for that like the network leaders Vermont has a 30 plus year well-established thriving um peer professional network called Vermont um they used to be called starting points but they're now called Vermont early childhood networks and each one's each regional one has its name and they're generally um set up by the because in Vermont we're governed by the agency of human services they're basically basically sort of roughly geographical along the AHS districts. Um, and so I think those those leaders would be, those peer professional networks would be logical places. And if they're not already on somebody's radar as being um, great places to host those meetings where you know there is regular um, engaged membership, um, you know, if that's where they're happening, excellent. If not, let's connect them. So just back to the, the second question. Um, in terms of the next step would be community conversations, because we have one set of stakeholders only in this issue, and that was the providers. We didn't include the parents, we didn't include businesses or anybody else, the, the larger group of stakeholders that would be involved. And that was a, a decision that was made by the steering committee that we would only focus on the providers only. Um, in terms of who's managing that, that's Sarah Kobolinski. She was supposed to coordinate that. Um, so I haven't heard from anybody on those. And like I said, I won't be back until at least the 6th of September. So they're going to be sometime after that. 
I don't know who those networks, I don't know who those folks are. She would be the person to contact in that regard. And she's on our steering committee. And as you probably know, she's in, on the advocacy committee, one of the co-chairs for that, uh, that particular group. Um, That's the, good the, to know. Sarah and I know each other um, personally and professionally. So um, uh, yeah, I guess I could reach out to her directly. Is that, so what, is it, would it be okay, Sean? Um, or do I need to go through you? No, 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 absolutely. Go talk to okay. her directly. Uh, I don't, okay. I, again, I don't know the providers. This is your field, not mine. So please, please do. Uh, reach out to her and find out because you may be able to help her to do that. And, yeah, uh, well, we also have something in Vermont called the BFIS system. It's, well, Bright Futures Information System. It's um, archaic and not a pretty thing, but it actually is <laughs> publicly accessible. And um, it's kind of user-friendly for the kind, for, for knowing every single, you can, you can see every single regulated program in the state of Vermont in the BFIS system and you can look it up by town. And that's super helpful for direct outreach to make sure that all the people um, in the in the area have been canvassed. Yeah, so, so yeah, oh. if I could hop in real quick. Hi, I'm Joanne Roberts. Hi, Brenda. Um, I've been hired as a consultant. Um, and so I do have a little bit of information to add. I know that um, Sarah Jackson reached out to Sarah Kay, in regard to the regional groups, particularly uh, Tammy Hazlitt brought that up. So she's in the loop as well. And the emails just went out this morning, following up with Sarah Kay to say, what should be our next steps? Um, because there was a conversation about just sharing the recording and everyone felt it would be more personable and just more informational to actually have Sean be present to answer the questions. So I know that the three of them are working on connecting the, the regional groups as well as Amy Brooks, I believe, um, is probably copied and CC'd on those to make sure that we're looking holistically at New Hampshire and Vermont. So I hope that helps a little bit as far as what people have been doing to move it forward. And then I'm just hearing Sean that you're away through September 6th. Yeah, and I'll be pretty much incommunicado. I'll be out of the country, so yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, and thanks for letting I really, me hop in. Joanne, welcome. It's so good to see you and meet you. Um, I, of course, read that you were coming on and happy to have you. Um, and uh, if you had to pick one person to represent the networks in this area, Tammy Hazlitt was, um, hit, you hit the jackpot. She <laughs> is active in two of the, she's a, a co-leader, um, of one of the the networks um, that I just described, and she is a longtime active member of another one. Um, so she has she's well connected, and she knows all the leaders in the third one that serves Windsor County. So perfect, um, thank you. Yeah, it serves it, basically. She covers all of Windsor County except the Springfield area and um, Southern Orange County, which is basically the the Upper Valley. So, Brent, you brought up something I, I wanted to ask a little because this, this did come up in the meeting. They were concerned about losing customers or kids. Um, the parents would go to this new center that would have 180 to 200 kids. That would be the capacity with a heavy emphasis on after hours work as well as infant care. So my understanding, there was a study that was done by somebody. I don't even know what it was done by that. We were short 2000 child care slots in the Upper Valley. And that situation has only gotten worse with COVID. So... And, and this center will be focusing on um, certainly those who could afford it the least. So I was just, I was, um, I wanted to explore that, how, why they would be concerned about actually losing market share or, or kids when I know my employees here can't find a place. They're struggling to be able to find a provider and yet they continue to close down all around us. So I just, I found that interesting that people were worried about that particular issue. You know, and I can't speak to it. I think it's it's um, it's unique to probably each program has their own you know sort of place from which they are concerned. Um, my, without speaking for anyone, and I'm not hiding any names here. I'm just like I'm just sort of passing along things that I that are people are saying, hey, have you heard about this? <laughs> yes, in fact, I'm a part of the committee <laughs> um, that's working on trying to come up with some solutions. Um, but uh, what I think people want very much to be um, is part of the conversation. And that's what I'm steering them toward. 
Um, and one of the things that I have shared with folks with program directors is, um, you know, your concerns are valid to you. I respect that. And um, if you have capacity to show up for community meetings and or, you know, um, work groups like this, please do, because many programs do not have the capacity to show up. I mean, this screen, we have Jen Parker. Yay, Jen, thank you. Um, but because they're covering in real time in classrooms. Um, and, um, you know, if you can show up, great. And there, there are a couple of people who I keep steering in this direction, hoping that they do show up so that they can articulate exactly what it is that concerns them. Um, sometimes I can clearly see the stated concerns. Um, I myself share the staffing concerns. Um, and sometimes I know they're unique to programs and I, I think people can really only speak for themselves. Yeah, I, I can understand the concern about losing staff that might go to a, a place that pays more money. But I just, I was a bit, um, I couldn't understand the issue that they were afraid they were not gonna have enough customers. I think that's probably the, I would think the least issue because from the customer perspective, Again, I'm an employer and I'm looking at parents that are struggling. I mean, really struggling to find childcare. Um, it just no, we know that we need more spaces. We know that we need more. Right. Yeah. Best case Sean, scenario. I, if I could just guess a little bit, um, I'm thinking that 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 concern was shared by some of the family providers that were in that meeting, because I think, you know, maybe some families are choosing family home care because that's where they could get a spot. And if a center spot opened up, then those families might choose to leave the family home provider in um, to get a, a, a center based program. And so I think some of that concern was was there. Um, I, I, that's just speculation on my part. And I also think that there were some centers who felt like they could expand capacity given certain parameters like for instance, the bathroom situation, you know, if they were able to add a bathroom, they could add 10 more spots. If they could hire, you know, one or two more staff, they could hire, you know, add in, you know, potentially eight more, eight to 16 more children, things like that. So I think that those might have been where some of that came from. You know, and that makes more sense, Jen, because one of my employees, Fred, in the next room, she's going to be going on in October. She was looking at a child care center and she liked the curriculum and the piece of the early childhood education component of that. And she has now, she's now settled on an in-home care provider, which does not have that structure and that sort of programming. So that, I guess that makes more sense to me if that the, because I don't know who the personalities were in that meeting. It, that, that makes more sense, I think, in, in that particular case. Um, and, and just in terms of the timing, like best case scenario will be 2024. Right. It took me 11 years to get the center in, in Allenstown put together. 11 years. Uh, I, I expect to do much better than that, but it just takes an, an enormous amount of time to make these things and get the stars to align, get the funding to align, and, and all the other issues that go along with it that we haven't even touched yet. Um, so it, I think that that could be potentially a piece um, to convey clearly at the top um, with all the folks who are who, who do engage in conversation um, because that will, like all of us who are in the biz understand that it's gonna take that much time. We know that. We're like four years the shortest, um, you know, <laughs> because we do it. But um, right now, it for some folks, I think very understandably, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm up against another thing. And even if it's not rational or they can't articulate it well, or even it's 100% rational and they can articulate it very well, it feels like another hurdle to their business. Um, I think the other thing, Sean, that it might be part of people's conversations about um, enrollment in on the Vermont side is that we have universal pre-K and that is expanding in a lot of communities, including some right here in the Upper Valley, um, to the detriment of programs who have depended on that revenue source of, of fully enrolled pre-K program and pre-K partnerships with public schools that are now actually, they're having to sunset, which takes away a significant part of their um, budget. You know, it removes like a whole line in their in their revenue side of their budget. And then and they're still trying to run a program and maintain the facilities and pay the staff. And they're, and they're just really struggling to figure out how without 
more public investments like Pronto, how to um, make the math work on with infants and toddlers only. So I think that's, even though it's not connected to what you're developing or what you're, you know, thinking about, um, it's sort of, it's, it's, it's present in the, in the air and in the, <laughs> it's present in the mix right now. And in so people world, are yeah. just like, oh my gosh, I can't afford to lose another kid or another staff member. So I guess just to be mindful of that's all helpful. the things. That's helpful because they live in their world that I don't understand, right? Exactly. Yeah, no, that's very yeah. helpful. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we, we've got this meeting on Friday. We're going to talk about next steps to, you know, and the next steps would likely be those meetings with the Vermont providers that they asked for. And then community conversations will be the next step to talk with members of the general public, parents in particular, who uh, uh, have a vested interest in um, certainly businesses and uh, other groups. Um, yeah, so that's the latest on any of that. Does anybody else have any other questions, any other thoughts on that particular issue? Sean, I just have one more, and I don't know if this came up, I can't recall at the moment. Um, but what about looking at different community areas and whether there was like town space that could be renovated? So this program in Lebanon that you're talking about, Amy Brooks kind of hanging on, if they were able to take those 40 spots into, I don't know, an SAU building that has space available that could be renovated, you know, could that be an alternative or an additional option to help that program survive with working with the city in a, in a city space? It, it would be, but we really do not have any viable spaces. We, we looked at the SAU building, the cost is enormous. To, it's 16 to $21 million to renovate that building and make that safe for that type of usage. And it just isn't practical because we were working with the school district to do that, making actually good progress with them, but it just doesn't make sense to do that. And I don't have any other city buildings. As, as, as a matter of fact, we're renting space for a number of our departments right now. Three different departments are actually located outside of city buildings where I lease space in different office buildings. So we, at least in the city of Lebanon, we really don't have the space to do that. You know, and certainly Joanne can talk this, but we're renovating schools that are way behind. Uh, and then, you know, even the, the money we just appropriated is because well, construction costs, of course, went up at the time. So we can't do all the things we'd like to get done there. And the same thing in Mount Leb School. And again, she can talk more about this, but we're not able to accomplish all the things we're trying to get done there. And we just don't have enough space uh, in those facilities. So we, in, in, at least in the city of Lebanon, we don't have uh, any place to be able to do that. And people keep talking about the SAU, but again, we, we had a joint project. We worked together on this and it just, it's just not feasible. Uh, it doesn't make sense to do that. Specific to the SAU, so I'll switch from consultant hat to superintendent hat, because you're actually seeing me at, in the SAU right now. Um, the reason this building wasn't used for a school and the reason that they consolidated schools was it's so out of date and so out of compliance. I looked at bringing our preschoolers here my second year. Um, the staircases, the, the hallways, the, the heights of the bathrooms, it's just not made for younger children and is in, is in a state that it wasn't a good use for um, a school, which is why it became office in any kind of community city that wants to come in and use parts of it. And as Sean mentioned, we spent a good part of a year talking about the costs. Um, I'm seeing our, our bids come in at 65% higher than what we anticipated for the cost for Mount Leb. Bids are going out for Hanover Street and the high school that, for the bond vote. We got our preliminary estimates and it's good 60 plus percent. Um, so we are working very hard to try to figure out what are the key pieces of those projects that the community voted for and is there any feasible way to like still come up with something. And so for Mount Lab, we're not gonna do the front entrance. We've really narrowed down the scope. Um, and I met for hours with our architects and project managers about um, Hanover Street and the high school. So, you know, the SAU comes up a lot and I thought we were potentially gonna be able to do something, but it was not cost effective to do so and we circle around a lot in Lebanon people have ideas but they haven't been in the buildings or something like that um, another another factor to think about 
is, and I just learned this at the advocacy meeting, is businesses are going off on their own and just doing it. So where Sean is kind of following a process and connecting and saying, well, what might this look like? You know, very community centered. We just learned that the River Valley Club is expanding um, and adding, I think, 180 slots. Um, and they're they're moving forward with that. And it was just kind of announced at the advocacy meeting. And it could be that I'm new, but it seemed as though that was a bit of a, a news <laughs> um, moment at the meeting that just happened Friday. So I, th I also think being new to it and listening a lot that there are some organizations and businesses that are just gonna see this need and go and work independently rather than try to synthesize something and do what Sean's doing. I don't know if it's a possibility, but perhaps some of the family and or smaller centers who are struggling might think of this as an opportunity to come together to run that program. Because Sean has said multiple times, that's not his background to actually run this program. So uh, another path or another thread or another thing for people to keep in their minds in talking about the, the Lebanon City Project is, are there some centers or people who have spent their lives in this profession who want to create something, a curriculum, uh, a philosophy that supports socioeconomic, um, high quality, affordable childcare in Lebanon in a central central location to try to, to um, decrease the number of slots. And Amy has taught me quite a lot from the conversations I've had and listening to Amy Brooks and talking about ideal numbers versus actual numbers for um, the different centers that they might be able to take a few more children, but they're concerned about their staffing. So they're really trying to find that balance which is hard to do and keep their, their businesses afloat. And they're so focused, which is wonderful on providing a wonderful experience for their, the children that they serve. As you mentioned, Brenda, there's just a lot coming at them from different places. Recently in New Hampshire for high schoolers, they agreed to pay $7.50 for a 15 hour, $15 an hour position if the center signed up. But that's another form of competition for the centers and family settings that aren't paying $15 right now. So it seemed like a good step forward from the DOE level can be perceived and in reality threatening to people who are running the, the centers or a family home setting. So I'm just sharing those because I think Brandu did a really good job of saying there are all these things coming at people right now. And that I learned all that just from our last meeting on Friday. So it is coming really fast. So if fit kids adds that many, I mean that, that's those are going to be market rate, I presume. I don't and that's yeah, they why. don't have a sliding. And I believe I believe they offer for their teachers, perhaps. Uh, Elizabeth obviously can talk more about it than I can, but like free membership to River Valley Club. Um, I don't know what their hours their kids are themselves. If they have children in the program, I don't know if it's late after hours care. Um, but she said that she, I think she said she secured funding through maybe Ledger, and they're going to be expanding. And 180 stuck in my mind only because it, it was about the same size that you were talking about, but it was a couple minutes conversation, and I just, I kind of, perked up when I heard that was was happening. So I don't I don't want to misquote or misrepresent, but I'm pretty sure that's what was said on Friday. And I don't know their time frame to be able to do that. Because unlike you, she or their or River Valley Club doesn't have to go through ARPA funding and all of that, go to the council as a private business, they can just kind of move forward, don't have the hurdles that you and I kind of have to jump through sometimes. Right, there's other hurdles she's going to have to, I mean, she's going to build a facility, which I don't know if she's going to rent the existing space somewhere else, or she's going to build a facility, what she's going to do, I don't know, the first mm -hmm. time hearing about it as well. Uh, yeah. But even even so, that's still, it's just a small percentage of the need. And right. we're dealing with a sliding scale for those who can afford to lease, so it's a different uh, group of people that we'd be looking at anyway. Um, so, uh, as I said in the meeting, the market will continue to adjust, it's going to do that on its own, no matter what we do. The question is whether or not we are going to step in and try to do something in the marketplace ourselves to 
uh, subsidize that sort of need. And the best that the city can do is I have pieces of land and I have a couple of those that might be viable for this. We have an industrial park we just built uh, and there are demands on that. We got people who want to lease out that space, but that location could be one of those locations. And there's, all, there's a couple of other pieces of city owned land that could be that we could uh, offer up for that particular purpose. So that's probably the best that the city could do. And then the other options we talked about using the city's bonding authority, which is much less than what the market rate is to go out and build a structure and then how that arrangement might be. As I told you, the scenario in Allen's town, the, the town owned the land um, and uh, we actually maintain the building with a custodian and everything else, pay for the light bill, all that cost. The programs come in, in this case, the Boys and Girls Club and the Senior Center, they run their programs. They don't have to worry about any of those other costs. So they're able to do that on a sliding scale and provide for those who can afford it the least. So those types of scenarios, those types of arrangements are what's possible. But in terms of, uh, again, city space, we don't have any buildings where we have vacant space, at least right now we don't. Sean, have you thought about the location of the land that you do have available and the accessibility of what that might look like? I'm just thinking like if it were in West Lebanon, for example, on, on 12A, you know, is that going to be a convenient location? I mean, for some parents, they're not going to care because they need the spots. I'm just curious if that's been a consideration too for you on, on what property you're looking at being available. I have limited pieces of property that are available, so it's a matter of a handful of, uh, of low properties that could be available for that purpose. I just I have what I have, and you know the the new industrial park has three phase power, water, and sewer, all of that. So that would be a major cost that someone else that's already stubbed out. Um, they're two acre lots, so they can fit a facility of this size. So that's that's the only consideration with that. Of course, there's a lot of employers up there that would be convenient for parents, certainly at that location. Um, there's a lot of high tech employers up there. And again, we're building an industrial park. There's another one that's being built right beside it because of the new road that we constructed up there. And, uh, you, you know, I think in the situation that people are dealing with, if they have to travel five minutes more to go someplace, I don't think that's going to be a major concern for them. Ideally, you'd want them on a bus route to have that. This is not presently on a bus route. Could it be in the future? Maybe. Um, but we're not going to have the ideal circumstances. Well, probably not anyway. Now, the other thing is, like, you know, as you know, I reached out to DHMC and they have not gotten back to me to, to talk about using potentially some of their property. The college owns a lot of land and so does not DHMC, but they have not gotten back to me. And it's been a couple months now. I met with them in June. I haven't heard a thing from them. So I'll follow up with them. Um, but I would, thought, I would have thought if they had an interest, they would have reached back out to me. I know they're planning on expanding their own facility their own operation, uh, doubling the size of it. Um, and you, because that, that's all I have for updates, if, unless anybody else to have, is more to talk about on this issue or any of the other issues that we've got on our agenda as a group. We only have a few things that are on there. All right, if there's nothing else, then I think that concludes our meeting for today. Um, and we are gonna keep our schedule that we have. Uh, I don't know when the next meeting is, I should say that because I'm not gonna be here for a couple of weeks.